EverQuest 2, the successor to one of the most popular MMORPGs in gaming history, is not worth playing in 2023. Probably should have dropped a spoiler warning. What's up, Bombers? Wilfredo here, and you heard what I said. EverQuest 2 is not worth playing in 2023. It is worth studying, however. I want to explain why this game, while not anywhere near the standards of modern day gaming, is a great case study for experimentation, and more importantly, how EverQuest 2's parts are far better than the sum, and where developers can add and improve in their games going forward. Let's briefly, and I mean briefly, talk about where EverQuest 2 started and some of the mistakes it's made over its 19 years. Launching in November 2004, EverQuest 2 came out five years after its predecessor, EverQuest, one of the most successful MMORPGs in gaming history. That is until 19 days after EverQuest 2's launch, where the new hotness, World of Warcraft, would dethrone the Titan deftly and swiftly. During EQ2's launch, Sony Online Entertainment had developed and published EverQuest 2, and it met heavy criticism from the fans for its new direction that EverQuest was going in. Now, EverQuest 2 isn't a direct sequel. It's an alternate timeline based on the EverQuest The Planes of Power story arc. This new game was a product of Sony's then favorable behavior of experimentation no matter the cost. Sony had a reputation for taking risk in the tech world with the creations of multiple failed products like Betamax, Minidisc, the UMD, and even the PS Vita, which I honestly love and still own, but there was never any real support after launch. So with that very brief history on Sony and EverQuest's very unusual timeline, you might be able to see where the flaws and flops pop up as a complete product, but the parts are actually great, even though the execution failed. Let's address EverQuest 2 as it stands currently. EQ2 has a free-to-play model with a sub option for those of you who want all the good bits and bobs. I played as a free player as this is where most people would have started as to avoid loss of investment when they experienced EverQuest 2 in its current standing. When you first boot up EverQuest 2, the game asks if you want to play a regular character or a heroic character. A heroic character gives you the option to basically try out a level 100 character with some restrictions. You can always buy a boosted character too, but if you're a new player, you realize that would be foolish. Before you create your character, you are given five play options to choose from. Traditional, the expected theme park MMORPG experience. Progression, where content is unlocked by release, much like the classic WoW servers. Event, or basically PvP. Free trade, where you can trade most items, including some items that would normally be bound to you. And the most recent, Lore and Legend, where all content is scaled to the character so you can play any of the content with anybody else, a la Elder Scrolls Online. Four of these modes are locked behind a paywall, so as a free player, you can only play traditional. Word in the wood is that most active players are on the progression servers. Character customization is the first part of the case study that I want to touch on, as while the customization of the character is limited, the scale is there in full force. There are 26 classes split between four archetypes and 22 races split between three alignments. That's a lot of player choice. And here's my first suggestion, game developers. Include more of this. Devs could seriously learn from this level of diversity. There's a little something for everyone. You've got animals for the furry community to literal ogres for those who want to feel big. The races and the stat differences should make a difference in how you want to play your character. If I want to play a Rotonga Bruiser, I should be able to play that in many other games as well. But the alignment, hmm, is something that could vastly be improved upon. Hear me out. While Swotor does a great job with player choice affecting the light and dark side alignments, why not add more depth to good and evil characters? Let's say you play a rogue. A neutral alignment gives you access to any and all skills available to the rogue class, but only evil rogues have access to villainous skills like backstab or assassinate. Good rogues should have access to more mischievous skills like stun locks or crowd control disguised as oil slicks or tying someone's shoelaces together, leaving the mob vulnerable to crits instead of just outright killing them. 
This creates new and challenging dimensions for players should they choose to RP a good or evil character. Why must a troll be inherently evil when elves are known for being somewhat xenophobic? And adding the alignment as a story beat in the game, a la Star Wars The Old Republic, would be icing on the cake, but that's just my opinion. The starting areas in EverQuest 2 are barren and definitely do not encourage new players to want to stick around. Don't get me wrong, once you get to a capital city, the population can be seen, but it's only in small spurts. It's a strange feeling you get when you're in these cities because they're bustling with life, but in reality, it's just NPCs milling about in their routine. While there are plenty of quests to complete, this is where another red flag pops up within EQ2, because there are a lot of quests within these cities. Case Study 2. Questing. Questing is scattered and peppered throughout Norrath, which isn't a bad thing, but it's not very consistent unless it's from a single quest giver. The quests are designed to be boomerangs to both the quest giver and the questing in general. Here's an example. Someone gives you a quest at level 10, and once you complete it, they have another quest ready for you at level 15. So you either have to find more quests for you to level or grind it out until you're the appropriate level, adding on to the monotonous traveling back and forth to the quest givers. And this is nothing more than adding gameplay time. So how do we fix this? Take the advancements from Guild Wars 2 and have many of the smaller quests not require you to go back to the quest giver. Many of these high fantasy games have magic so you can explain away the traveling thing through some like medium or something like that. Or you can choose to go back to the quest giver, but there should be at least a choice there. Case Study 3. Combat. Combat is what you expect for any standard tab target MMO, and many other games have vastly conquered EverQuest 2 in that arena, from the extremely fluid tab targeting to full-on action combat. One thing EverQuest 2 did get right to a degree was their heroic opportunity system. Basically, it's a combo system to get the most bang for your buck in combat. The game knows which combos are frequently used by players and groups and creates a rotation that the entire party can jump in on, making some real moments happen. I like this, but eventually, it becomes the same rotation and will likely lose its shine really, really fast. Unfortunately, combat doesn't really open up until about level 20, and this really hurts the game. While questing, I spent more time fighting off pointless mobs with little to no XP reward, almost grinding the game to a halt. Once you get to level 20, you can upgrade your skills using Daybreak Coins. While you can find upgrade books in your travels, the drop rate is small from what I've noticed. Another thing EverQuest 2 got right, kind of, is leveling skills. Yes, plenty of games are doing that, but not all. Guild Wars 2 could definitely use this as wielding a longsword and using the same three attacks for your main hand as your basic weapon never improves. Your weapon does. Your level does. Why not level the skills to master levels as you progress? You can even upgrade your spells. Mind you, EverQuest 2 makes you grind out the resources and makes you wait in real time for the upgrade, but the fact that you can upgrade your spells is awesome. It's just in the wrong game. There are games out there that do this well, like Black Desert Online. But some games just need to grab this and then make it something worth investing. Okay, features. There are a lot of features in this game, but I'm not going to go through all of them, just the big ones, okay? Because EverQuest 2 has been doing a few things right from the start, and other things that have that Sony behavior that I mentioned earlier. Crafting is the first, and man, this crafting system is awesome, but I think it's a bit backwards. From the game's start, you can craft anything. Armor, weapons, furniture, jewelry, etc. And as you progress in your crafting journey, you eventually have to choose between one of four classes, and those branch off into subclasses. It's extremely deep, but I think it should be the other way around. Learn a single skill trade, and then as you grow in that skill, you can learn new skills to expand upon your portfolio, so you can become a master craftsman in some, but only decent in others. You know, you maintain a focus, but still a jack of all trades. The other thing about the crafting is that it's a mini game. This keeps players invested in what's being crafted instead of just watching bars fill. Adding in a mishap or imperfection that can be avoided due to a diligent eye for detail kind of creates a sense of accomplishment in what's being crafted. 
If this was more of a timing-based system similar to DDR key presses, each miss means lesser quality. That'll really test a true crafter's skill. Next is player housing, and when I say EverQuest 2 has player housing on lock, this is where EverQuest 2 shines bright. The player housing takes me back to Wildstar. You're giving a floating rock of personal space, and you can create some outstanding player homes. From strange hospitals, to mountain lodges, to everything in between. This player housing system is amazing. Many of these player-made homes have secret passages and crazy designs that let the imagination thrive. Bring this version of player housing into modern gaming, and I can reassure you that I'll be playing your game for quite some time. Another feature is something you don't hear about in MMORPGs, and that's a dungeon maker. Yeah, a player-made dungeon to really throw players for a loop. While this feature wasn't really utilized very much in EverQuest 2, in games like WoW, Guild Wars 2, ESO, BDO, and upcoming games like Throne and Liberty and Blue Protocol, this would be something to really get those dungeon crawlers a run for their money. It's not the greatest thing in its current form, but with enough time and imagination, Dungeon making can really and definitely scratch that itch for dungeon runners and MMOs. One final feature I really want to talk about is one that was never released into the game, but it was something that made me really want to play EverQuest 2 when I heard about it. SOE Mode. Sony took another one of those risks that I mentioned earlier and had beta footage of your webcam tracking your face and bringing your character to life in game. With some tweaks and some additional upgrades, this would be a role player's dream if implemented decently. Being able to voice chat with your character, exhibiting your facial expressions to your party or guild would make for some truly immersive experiences to revel and rejoice about with your friends online. Why aren't the games doing this yet? I mean, the metaverse just got legs. You mean to tell me we can't do this? We have VR and we can't make this happen? Now, here's a case study in cash shops that won't blow your mind at all, but it might trigger something. Good, I hope. When it comes to the cash shop, there's not much to say except don't do things this way. Well, kind of. The only advantage that Daybreak Games brings to the table is that one subscription grants you access to all of the games under the Daybreak name, so you can play multiple games with one sub. That, in my opinion, is worth the sub if it wasn't for the slew of bad or outdated games. And I actually enjoy DCUO. This practice is great for the amount of content you have access to, but for the most part, these games feel like they've been in maintenance mode for ages. Then there's the <clears throat> annoying exit screen. As a free player, it pops up every time you log out. Get all access. Here's your subscription options. Blah, blah, blah. I know about the subscription options. You blast it in game, too. Otherwise, this cash shop is rough and confusing at times, and there are too many currencies to deal with, very much like the Zen store. Overall, no. EverQuest 2 is not worth playing in 2023, and I still hold hope that the EverQuest IP isn't dead because Norath has a lot of potential to come back and be a top tier IP again with the right development and backing, of course. But as a game to dissect and analyze the components of, EverQuest 2 could hold the keys to winning its throne back. Is it likely? <laughs> Doubt it, but 19 years of gaming feedback, lessons should have been learned by now. While the world is vast, fairly dense from an NPC perspective, tons of lore and lots to do, the execution of EverQuest 2 has been a mess since launch. I crave a deep, rich world to get lost in, and while games like Final Fantasy XIV and New World exist, EverQuest 2 has a good chunk of this, but it's just a sloppy mess, like a Mexican pizza that survived a reckless Grubhub driver. And to Daybreak Games, please find a way to restore the EverQuest IP to its former glory. You have all of the ingredients, now you just have to portion, prep, and cook your masterpiece dish. What do you think? Do you think EverQuest 2 is worth playing in 2023? Let us know in the comments down below. Then head over to MMOBomb.com for more news, videos, podcasts, and more in the realm of the multiplayer. Stay safe, stay sick, and I'll see you guys on the other side.